this video, we're gonna be talking about the Dactyl Cam Live, full tutorial and setup, really going from the case, to hanging on the line, installing the camera, the head, all the accessories, and really just getting into the shots uh, and programming the system as we really want it to operate. Uh, in this scenario, or this tutorial, we're gonna be using the Dactyl Cam Live, but the same uh, principles that we talk about in this tutorial are gonna be the, the same across to the Dactyl Cam Pro. And the camera we're gonna be using is our EX250, but ultimately you can take any uh, head or camera package up to 80 pounds for the Dactyl Cam Live, and up to 150 pounds for our Dactyl Cam Pro. So let's get started. We'll go from uh, taking it out of the case, it comes fully built in the case. The only thing you'll have to attach is the Mitchell riser and our safety bracket. And whenever you get it out of the case and you have your line already stretched, and whenever you put the system on the line, you're gonna notice that this line has a line locker, which is this metal uh, here with a spring. And what we wanna do is we're gonna take the line on the drive side. So there's the drive side, which has the motor and the wheel, and I'm gonna take the line, and I'm gonna simply push it underneath this wheel. And the way I'll do that is push it into that line locker with a spring, and it locks. And I'll do the same for the other side. Now that the system's physically in the line lockers, it's attached to the line, but that doesn't mean we're done. We want to make sure that the line goes over the drive wheel bracket. It's not adjusted, it's just simply attached. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, take our, our safety bracket and we're gonna close that gap. Now in this scenario, we're using a single line, but all the time that you're gonna be using the Dactyl Cam Live, you wanna make sure that you're running two lines, one on the drive and one for a safety. About four inches to as much as six inches above that drive line. What John's doing is he's closing that gate and he's keeping that uh, safety bracket captive. So he's using the bolts on our four, all four sides and ensuring that that's tight. You'll notice the top has uh, like a bike latch. He's gonna simply loosen the screw on the back side and then tighten that latch. He doesn't wanna over tighten it. If you over tighten that, it basically squeezes the frame. So it's finger tight. Now if I walk up to it and check it, I can open that latch decently easy and I can close it back down, but it's not gonna swivel. You'll notice when he grabbed it, he could push it back and forth and you don't want that to swivel. Once you have your safety line attached underneath that wheel, that's gonna keep it really nice and tight. And that's how you would attach your safety bracket onto the system. Now the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and attach the head. We're gonna get the batteries plugged in and we're gonna walk through that setup and show you those details. In this scenario, we're gonna be using our EX250. The EX250 is, is our uh, fully stabilized camera solution that's a uh, 25 to 300 mil lens. You can obviously use anything from your Newton head, shot over, uh, Ronin, uh, Libra heads, you, you name it. You've got all the options up to 80 pounds on the uh, Dactyl Cam Live and up to 150 pounds on the Dactyl Cam Pro. And so we're just gonna use it for the sake of this video. Now, uh, the next thing we're gonna do, once you use the Mitchell shank and the nut to get into the Mitchell mount, this is our riser, this is a three inch riser. We also have a six inch riser. We're gonna plug the batteries in. Now the batteries are the 56 volt batteries. There's two of them, one on the left side, one on the right. When you plug these in, John's gonna simply find the, uh, the notch in the battery tray and he's gonna find that notch and you'll, and you'll hear that lock in. So that slides and locks in place. And he's gonna do the other side on the, just the same. And you'll hear that lock, which is really important. Now, one thing to keep in mind, these batteries are self-locking. To get them off, you have to use a key to put the key in, turn the key and pull them off to unlock it. And that's for safety. So you really wanna make sure to keep those keys uh, in, a, in a safe place, but they're self-locking. And then usually when we attach it, our team always says to self-check. So I'll come back and we'll check to ensure that these batteries are properly seated and there's no chance they're coming out and that that self-lock is in there. Now that we have our batteries plugged in, our head is, is uh, installed using the Mitchell shank and the Mitchell nut. We wanna check that everything's plugged in the way that we want. So our batteries are routed via the Limo cables here. And typically we keep those installed even when it's in transport. You have two Limo plugs that go to each battery. And then over here, you'll notice what's unique about the Dactyl Cam Live is the Ethernet switch. This Ethernet switch is built onto the sled. It gets its power through DTAP, and then it has Ethernet going to the Dactyl Cam Live sled, but it also has Ethernet that'll go directly into our EX250 or any other head you have. The benefit of this is it allows us to be able to install an external radio. So we're gonna bring an external radio in, we're gonna show you how to install that and where that goes within the system. Whenever we're using the Dactyl Cam Live using IP, meaning uh, Ethernet to control the system, we're gonna use an external radio. In this case, Defy has an external radio that we house and put into this system to make it very simple. So we have a radio that'll attach to the sled, we'll have a return radio at our console, and that radio will get its power from the DTAP. It'll also get its data cable plugged directly via Ethernet into the switch built into the sled. 
Now, if you don't have that, we also have RF. This is your RF box on the sled right here. And that has either 900 megahertz, 800 megahertz. Uh, there's many other uh, frequencies that we can put into that. Uh, and then you obviously have this option of the ethernet switch and the external radio. So this option that we're showing you here gives you both uh, external radio. This is running 2.4 or 5.8. And then we also have our 900 plugged in and we can run both of those simultaneously and be able to switch between them. And we'll show you that a little bit later in the tutorial. So John's attached the radio. You always wanna make sure the antenna is pointed either up or down. Typically we always go up so that it's not in the range of the, of the head. And then on this side, you'll notice that he touched, he, he hit the button on the side that says power. That power button is not the power to the system. It's actually power to your DTAPs. So once he turns that on, it goes green and the power to the DTAPs now power on your ethernet switch. We have power onto the radio. And then our EX250 has a cable that will also power either DTAP or LIMO. And so that can plug in and go from there. Now, how do I get system power? System power isn't from your accessory power plug. It's actually from the batteries. Each battery will have, a, will have a plug on it. So if I take the cap off, you notice that the battery has an on and off switch on both sides. It's really common that people ask about, uh, you know, experiencing less run times. And it's so important to make sure that you turn on one battery and then you check your voltage, you turn the other battery on and you also check your voltage. Now what we're looking for is that there's no variance, major variance between the batteries. If one turns on and it's 52 volts, we want the second battery to be within one volt. We don't want it 52 volts here and 48 on the other one. What's happening is you're unbalancing the amount of batteries that are in the system and you want them as balanced as possible or similar voltage. So uh, in this scenario, uh, both batteries are running 54.2 volts, which is nearly 100% charged, ready to go. And that's really important. Uh, the last things we're gonna do with this setup is um, we can, uh, on our EX250, we're actually running our internal batteries. I do have the option of external power. Uh, the same is true if you're running other heads that you might have, uh, you simply either power it from our sled, which at the bottom of the sled, you'll notice here we have uh, a 24 volt output via Limos. We have a 14 volt output, and obviously we have our 14 on the side, giving you tons of options to power uh, other heads you might use, other camera systems, other accessories. You might be using a Teradek or you might be using a, an extra lens control. You have all those options built directly into the sled with those limos on the bottom as well as your DTAPs on the side. Now, with the head itself, I'm gonna, with the 250, I'm simply gonna uh, put this in the position. I'm gonna power this head on and we're gonna um, go to the console in just a little bit and we'll talk about how to get this set up. The last thing I wanna do, which I think is one of the more important ones, is adjusting the drive wheel tension. So let's take a look at that a little bit more closely and talk through drive wheel tension. So let's take a closer look at the drive wheel and we'll talk about uh, making the drive wheel setting really efficient. It's not really right or wrong, it's really an efficiency or efficiency. If it's done right, the system will stop properly, it'll take off properly, and it won't use as much power. So what John's gonna do, he's gonna pull this pin here and we're gonna talk through uh, that setting and how to check to make sure that what we've set it to is correct. When we pull the pin, you really wanna have your line not stretched 100%, but also not loose. You wanna get it in an operable state. Once your line is kind of in an operable state, then you know that whatever you tension it to is gonna be a good place to get started. So when I go to take this wheel, I'm gonna simply grab this bottom drive wheel encoder and I'm just gonna lift up. Now what I'm doing is I'm finding a, a hole that will match um, the tension that I want to put on the actual wheel itself. And so typically I would say this is a two man job. You've got one guy lifting, you've got one guy putting a pin. Could you do it solo? Probably not recommended. Um, when we put the pin in, there's a few things we're gonna looking at. And, and, and traditionally, depending on your tightness of the line, you're gonna, you're gonna have that etching mark either at a three or at a four. Most of the time it's on a three, unless we're on a very soft line like we are today where it might go to a four. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump up here, we're gonna check that tension. So what we want to have is, is somebody to be able to lift that line. You wanna barely be able to lift it off that rubber. If it's really easy to lift, doesn't mean it's wrong, it just means it's a little bit of a softer tension. And so we have the ability now, looking at this, we can go up a hole or we can come down a hole. This is a pretty good spot. Whenever you're in a tighter tension, so you're in a proper job that you've got maybe 300 feet of line, you wanna just be able to grab that line and just barely move it. If it doesn't budge at all, it's probably too tight. Now, if it's too tight, when you let go of the stick in operation or the foot pedal, it's gonna stop quickly. If it's too loose, it might glide a little too far. If it's also too loose, you might experience slip. So these are some of the things you have to keep in mind when you're wanting to adjust the drive wheel tension. And again, it's not so much right or wrong, it's just finding that, that efficiency that works. Uh, and again, I think once you put the pin in and you have your drive wheel tight, you wanna check it. 
If you're not lifting it at all off the rubber, it's likely too tight, come down a hole. If it's super easy to get off that rubber, go up a hole. And you're gonna find that average that really works for you as an operator to make sure you're finding that efficiency and the performance you want out of the system. So now that we're all set, we're gonna get to operating. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug in the, the uh, data cable for my EX250 to go through my ethernet switch. Now I have the option of using my internal radio or the ethernet switch, but for the sake of the video, I'm gonna use both. So I'm gonna plug in that external radio into my ethernet switch up there. Um, just something that we can show you at the desk. Uh, just to do a quick recap, I've got both batteries in. My voltage is at 54.2 volts. I have my 900 megahertz antenna plugged into the back of my comms box, which is here. My drive wheel tension is set and checked. My safety bracket is installed um, and my safety line, which is not shown here in the, demo, in the uh, tutorial, is underneath those brackets. It's not too tight here. I have on this side my uh, ethernet switch plugged into DTAP with the power on. And I've got my data, my external data radio plugged in with power to DTAP as well as my ethernet switch. And a point to mention, you don't have to have an external radio because the Dactocam Live does have internal radios in multiple frequencies. We're choosing to have redundancy where I have internal uh, 900 megahertz in this case and an external 2.4 that is running from my switch. So again, it's an accessory, it's a nice to have, but not something you have to have, which is another uh, major benefit of the Dactocam Live. So let's go back to the console. Let's take a look at the setup now that we have everything uh, set up and ready to operate and uh, start running some shots. Now that we're sitting at the console for the operator station, let's walk through some of the layout of this station. It's gonna be different for everybody, of course, but let's just talk through it. So this is the pulse controller for the sled itself. This pulse controller will program the system um, and that will be wireless uh, as well as your console. In this scenario, we've got our EX250 console. And then on this side, I have my ethernet radio and my ethernet switch. And my ethernet radio will uh, likely for your setup have a PoE uh, as well, so you'll plug that in. So basically this will be the majority of what I'm gonna have on 95% of the shoots unless I have other accessories. So let's talk about the EX console first, and then we'll go to the pulse control. So the EX console is a fully wireless console. On the back, I have a battery that I can simply plug in, and now I'm wireless, or I plug AC power in to the, uh, to the appropriate uh, limo and plug that in. So once I have the battery on, it's simply turned on, and I plug my 400 megahertz antenna in the back, or I plug my ethernet switch in um, to my ethernet radio, and I can run either internal radio if it's equipped with it, some of them are not, and some of them are solely ethernet, which is primarily how we build most of these. And you're gonna use your ethernet radio plugged in via ethernet in the back. Whenever I plug that in, the ethernet will come green. And in this case, if I'm on uh, internal radio, my modem will be green. So now that I have that system on, let's reach over and let's get uh, our pulse controller set up. So on the pulse itself, it'll have a battery. This is a BPU-30 that simply slides in the back. Uh, it also has the option of an AC power or a larger battery, but uh, I'm gonna go to this top left up here. You'll see power, standby. I'm gonna select the power button. Let's turn it on. Now that the pulse controller is on, let's talk through some of the button and the features and the layout. So up here on the top left, you'll see the power button. It turns the screen and the system on. Uh, the top right is your standby button. Uh, to activate it, I take it out of standby. You'll know it because it says sled off. And if I hit standby, it says sled on. We're obviously going to keep it off as we go through the tutorial. You have in-stop one and in-stop two. So that's my left and my right in-stop as I drive it. And that is coordinated with these red boxes here. So the red boxes will turn green once I select my in-stop left or my in-stop right or one and two. On the bottom, you've got three knobs. So you've got acceleration, you have deceleration, and you have your overall speed. The acceleration from zero to 100 is how quickly is it sensitive to take off or to, to start the move. The higher the percentage, the sens more sensitive it is to start the move. The landing or the deceleration in the center here is how soft does it come to a stop at the end stop. So it's not in reference to uh, it stopping power when I let go of the stick, it's as I get to the end stop, how aggressive does the system stop? The higher the percentage, the closer to the end stop it'll go, the lower the percentage, the further away from the end stop it will begin to slow down. And then over here, obviously max speed. Max speed actually goes from zero to 125%, um, and that's just your overall speed uh, for your gas pedal. You have your uh, joystick here in the center. The joystick also acts as a kill switch in the center that I can kill the system for safety as well as my standby. And one thing to note is to get into the main menu of the system, you'll notice the ugly button in the middle. That deceleration button, if I press it in, is actually the menu button. When I click the menu button, it brings up a whole nother set of menus. You'll notice that now I have a home, which is associated to this button, and status, which is associated to the in-stop two button. So if I want to scroll through this, 
The main things I'm gonna call out are these features here. You'll so, see brake says no. Brake is a feature we put in if the system is has the end stop set and you want to apply a brake or the motor becomes a brake, it'll say yes and I can select it. That's really in unique instances where it's on an incline or a decline and you wanna really hold position, you can activate that brake. The second one is a power. Now, in most of these systems we have, it says no options because this is a feature that we wanna put in for future upgrades to have third-party accessory power control. It's currently not available yet, but you'll notice it in the firmware and we're gonna leave that in there until we have that rolled out. So power right now is not a function, but we do have it in that firmware for future innovations. The most important one here is drive tuning. That's how you tune. That's how you tune the system and you make sure that it's reacting the way you want to. So that's one we're gonna focus on the most. I'm gonna click that. You'll notice it comes up with P, D, and slip. P is the power, D is the demand, how quickly do I uh, use the power to get to the speed you're asking me to do, and then slip. You'll see there's two, two uh, rows or two columns of numbers. The first column is my, my actual, so what it's actually reading, and the last column here is the demand. So the demand is what I'm telling it to do, the actual is what it's actually doing. So it's just uh, part of the engineering uh, of the system to make sure that it's correct. The way that we set this, default is 30, 30, 40 in this scenario. So 30% P and 30% D is just default. Now, Drew, when would I have a higher number? That's really based on your payload. If you have 80 pounds hanging into the system, what's really good is I would take the P to 80, and I would take also my D to 80. My, and and it, we've, we've engineered this to be as simple as possible so that they really match. The power and the demand should really match in this scenario. I say a great place to start is the amount of weight. Um, I've got an EX250 under here right now, but if I was to move to a shot over or a Newton or a much larger head, I could simply raise that P and D gains. The other thing is if I'm shooting something with high speed or high performance, I might want a higher gain just so the system is more reactive, it's more sensitive. Or vice versa, if I'm shooting a slow broadcast, I might want those gains really low so that the system is very soft and, and a little bit sluggish because that might be nice for the type of shot I'm doing. For the sake of this video, let's keep our P at 30 and our D at 30, and that's where we'll get started. Now our slip, you'll notice right here underneath here, it says slip at 40. The lower the percentage, the less I'm allowing slip, the more percentage, the more I'm allowing it to slip. You really don't want it 100% because the wheel can actually turn very fast and smoke the line, but you also don't want it probably any less than 20% because that's just too slow. You're not gonna get a lot of speed out of it. I think that 30 to 40% mark is kind of the sweet spot. If, I, if you keep scrolling down, you'll notice the next button. If I click on the next, it's gonna take me to two options, brake and coast. So the brake is currently set at 5%. And what that's telling me is when I get to the end stop, how much percentage am I allowing the motor to hold that position? And I, honestly, we don't really use the brake a lot. If it's set at 100% and you go to lunch and forget about it, it's holding that motor on the end stop, which is causing a lot of battery draw and a lot of heat. Honestly, we default that to around zero to 5%. You really don't need to use it unless you really need that brake at the end stop. And the coast is set to 100%, means it's giving maximum power to stop the system. If I were to lower that percentage, it's gonna coast even further. My suggestion on the dactyl cam systems is really to keep your coast at 100%. We have this in here for our systems because in engineering and when we design the system, we do a lot of different testing for different applications. And we found we've added this in, but keeping it at 100% is primarily where we want you to keep that system during operation. If I go back to the next button, it's gonna take me back to that same page. And I'm gonna like everything I just did there. So I'm gonna go back to the home, go back into the menu. And that is uh, the last bit of the drive tuning. And the last one here is options. I'm gonna click that. And now I've got all these features. I'm gonna quickly go through them. RF link just tells me what channel I'm on, what frequency I'm on. Um, if I go into joystick, I have the options of dead band functions or turning it off. Maybe I don't want my joystick because I just have my foot pedals plugged in. Uh, all that is, is, is in this feature. I'm gonna hit back. Miscellaneous gives me options like uh, sound, which we primarily keep off. You can change your theme or the color of the, uh, like mint or rose is quite nice. <laughs> and then for all of our friends in Europe, you've got metric, obviously. Uh, we're in uh, USCS, but uh, metric is obviously in there as well. So let's go to the back. When I click back, uh, if I like, if I made those changes and I like it and I want it to stay that way every time I turn it on, I can go down to save as default. I'm gonna click it. I'm gonna confirm that. And now everything I just changed is gonna save. So when I turn the pulse controller back on, it's gonna recall those settings. The only thing it won't save is your end stops and that's for safety. Let's go to the home page and then let's get started. Last but not least, I do wanna mention the pulse controller has a few options on the back. You'll notice this antenna. 
We do have uh, two options, one where the internal RF is built into the sled, and the second option is a comms box. The comms box is very simply where the antenna plugs in. There's another cable that goes to an external box. That external box is used when we have Ethernet and other RFs. A lot of systems have a comms box. For the sake of this video, we're showing it with the internal antenna, uh, but the comms box simply plugs in, and the antenna would either go on the box, or in this case, it goes on the back of the pulse. And then over here, you'll notice the foot pedals are simply plugged in and are underneath me, a left and a right pedal. So now that the dactyl cam is in front of me, my EX console uh, is turned on here. I'm gonna simply go into my menu of my EX console. I'm gonna go down to power and I'm gonna engage my motor power. So it was already turned on, but I'm gonna toggle that off. I'm gonna toggle it back on. The head is engaged. And now I've got a picture up here. I've got a head control. And what I'll do is I'll actually just uh, quickly just do a quick uh, exposure adjustment to make sure I've got control of my iris. Uh, my, I'm at 1080 60. I've got color options for manual white balance, uh, color gain. I've got ND filters. All of that is really just built right into this, which just gives me a plethora of options to color correct and dial the system in the way I want to. Now, there's not a lot of light in the room, so we're just going to use that to play. So let's go up here to my standby, and I'm going to activate that by hitting the standby and turning that on. Now, before I hit the joystick or the foot pedals, I want to make sure that my speeds are turned down. I, I sometimes like to be around the 20 to 30 percent uh, mark when I'm going to set my end stops. We want it pretty slow, especially on a line that we're as short as we are here. So I'm activated, I'm gonna use my, joy, uh, my foot pedal, and I'm gonna set it a right end stop. Let's just call it right there. So I'm gonna go over here to end stop two, or right, and you'll notice it turns from red to green. And it says zero feet. If you're in meters, it'll also read meters. And I'm gonna go to my left pedal, and I'm gonna push that left pedal, and I'm gonna go set a left end stop. Uh, for the sake of it, of this video, I'm gonna set it there, and I'm gonna close the gate. So you'll notice it says 12 feet from the end stop on that side and zero feet from that end stop, which means I'm on it. You'll also notice it says break, meaning it's holding itself in that position. Now I can use the joystick and I can come up here and just kind of move it. You'll notice as I move it, it gives me miles per hour or meters per second if you're using it. And it also gives me my distance to the end stops. All that detail is built right into that sled. Now the other thing that's really important is I can slam that stick all the way left and you'll notice it comes to a really nice slow stop. That's because my landing's at 50% and that end stop is set. So same thing, I can go right, I can go full stick, and I can trust that it's gonna stop and slow down exactly as I want it to. Now, if I want it to go even faster to the end stops, I can raise that landing up, I can get a little bit more run out of my, out of a uh, little bit more length out of my run. And let's go again. So now I'm getting even closer to the end stop before it slows down, it's a little bit more aggressive. Uh, again, this is not realistic because it's such a short line, but it gives you an example of how to set that system and really get the system dialed the way that you want it to operate. Um, you can go into uh, to this and you can increase your P and D values, you can decrease them, but really, once you set your gain settings, it's your acceleration and your overall speed is the most important thing. Now that I have my console set, my pulse controller is dialed in, it's programmed, my end stops are set, I'm really just confident, I'm comfortable, I'm ready to start shooting.